Well, hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to this uh, webinar on um, the Recording Data and Rights Standards operated um, and created by DDEX. Um, this uh, webinar is uh, a follow-on from a series of webinars that were um, carried out in uh, June this year. Um, my name is Mark Isherwood, and I'm part of the Secretariat, and I'm also joined at this stage by my colleague, uh, Vanessa Bastian. Um, and um, in the course of um, this event, we're very keen that you should you, you should ask questions um, about the standards or indeed anything in relation to implementation of the standards. Um, and we'll talk about how, how we go about that uh, in a moment or so. So as I said, this is a, a follow-on webinar. And um, our agenda for this morning is to, there'll be a brief recap of what RDRN is and what it does, and also a, a brief introduction to one of the other standards in this group, the RDRR, um, which is, stands for Revenue Reporting. <clears throat> and then um, the sort of meat of our session is a panel discussion um, we have representatives from both the record companies and uh, music licensing companies, um, and they will talk very briefly about their experiences um, of implementation and what they learned uh, and what the important things are to consider when you approach an implementation, uh, particularly of the uh, RDRN standard, focusing as much as possible um, upon business benefits, the operational challenges, and other gen general implementation experiences. And then, as I said, excuse me, <coughs> um, we we very much want to have a Q&A session with, with you uh, attending um, this event so that you can learn or get your questions answered so that that will help you set yourself up for um, uh, carrying out implementations either now or in the future. So I'm going to hand over at this point to Vanessa. Thanks. Welcome and thank you for joining this open session today. I'm Vanessa, as Mark introduced me, and I'm working with the members of the RADAR Working Group. So from all the DDEX standards available to make the communication of data along the entire value chain more efficient, we are today looking at um, just the highlighted section you can see here on the slide, which is the Recording Data and Rights Standard, um, often referred to as RADAR or RDR. Um, I personally can't keep deciding which one I prefer best and keep switching between the two. So today, this is um, what we are concentrating on, and you can see just how many more DDEX standards there are um, in the kind of washed out gray tube map on this slide. But um, radar is what we are talking about today. It's a suite of messages used to exchange resource level information for the use in the collective management of neighboring rights between repertoire owners or administrators of records and their contributors and music licensing companies. So um, the latest version of the Recording Data and Rights Standard has three parts which cover messages to um, revoke, request and update rights claims and is called the radar notification, as Mark pointed out already, um, already or in short, radar N. Um, the second part is the radar R, the radar reporting message, which is there to declare revenues generated from the usage of resources and releases to owners of rights in recordings, their administrators or agents. And the third part of this suite of um, standards is called the radar C or radar choreography, which defines the workflow processes for the efficient and accurate exchange of all the messages. So that is a general overview of the messages and the standards that we, we cover in our working group uh, in DDEX. However, it, it, not only do we have three parts called radar N, R and C, the version most complement, uh, commonly implemented today is called completely differently. It's called MLC 1.4. And MLC stands for Music Licensing Company 
standard. And it actually contains the equivalent of all the three parts of the latest version that we just mentioned. Um, it's one big suite of messages and it's an XML. And then the Music Licensing Collective, the MLC was established in the US, which triggered the name change of our DDEX standard to avoid any kind of confusion. Slide eight, please. Thank you. The company is currently part of DDEX and actively shaping the standards in the uh, radar working group. Uh, on the left, the music licensing companies and on the right, the record companies and distributors. In the middle, you see uh, um, an overlapping box. It's in the center are the communication hubs to administer those rights and associated royalties using um, the standard and exchanging it between the left and the right. So all those centralized hubs are using the radar standard and there's a clear symbiotic relationship between the use of MLC 1.4 and the onboarding to one or more of those systems. This has greatly driven the wide implementation of the standard and continues to drive the development and functionality of the radar standard. Those involved in implementing MLC 1.4 internally are also those actively participating in the working group calls, and some of those are here with us today. And um, as you can see on the slides, they are mainly using the declaration of sound recording rights claim message and the rights claim status update message. And we'll be talking about this in more detail uh, during the panel discussions. So just a quick overview um, for um, giving you an overview of Radar R. Um, at the last session in June, we primarily introduced Radar N, and today we just quickly go through um, the communication and the content of the revenue reporting standard. As you can see on the diagram, this message allows the reporting of revenue figures of neighboring rights income from music licensing companies to other music licensing companies so that they then can report to their record companies and ultimately contributors and producers can be remunerated. So XML is not best suited for tabular data and hence the radar working group has adopted the same principle as the DSR standard and created a flat file version of the reporting message in MLC 1.4. You can see that the structure of the uh, message has got um, the header record and the footer record, the summary records, then the producer revenue record and new records can be added to report revenues to performer. So it's a very simple, rich TSV file, um, which allows uh, the core data to be communicated between all the stakeholders. Um, considering MLC 1.4 is still the most used version, um, we are seeing some first implementation with feedback coming back to the working group of the radar R 1.0. Uh, for all those wishing to find out more about DDEX standards um, and seek to implement them, the knowledge base is a, a free resource and can be accessed uh, at the link on the slide kb.ddex.net um, and you can find a variety of guidance, uh, resources, articles, and most importantly, the radar data dictionary, which is really the foundation that, um, that all the DDEX standards are based on. So you've got the text of the standard, you've got implementation notes, you get, um, as I said, the DDEX dictionary and access to much, much more. So I hope this was a very fast and brief overview. And if you have any questions, uh, please don't hesitate to uh, just open your mic or um, use the chat and the whole DDEX secretariat will be there to, to help answer your questions. Does anybody have any questions at this point? Okay, so uh, thanks Vanessa for that. Uh, that's very much set the scene. Uh, now what we want to do is to go into our panel discussion. 
So let me first of all uh, introduce uh, the panelists. From the rights owner side, from the record companies, we have Luca Tapparelli from Un Universal Music Group, uh, and then um, also Rob from the Beggars uh, Group as well. On the music licensing company side, we have from PPL, Stuart Fitzsimon and Rod Keenan, and also Mark Gez. And? Mike from uh, ReSound. Uh, and then finally, if anybody's got any really technical que questions, uh, my colleague Niels Rump is also here to, to ask any um, deep down technical questions uh, about the standards. So um, if the uh, uh, panelists could uh, open their mics and their cameras, that would uh, be great. Um, welcome, everybody. So um, thank you for um, making yourselves available to do this. Um, let me start really um, by asking each of you to just um, talk very briefly about your experiences of implementing um, the various uh, standards so far. So perhaps uh, start up with uh, Luca, um, just a brief explanation of, of your experience with implementing the RDR notification mm -hmm. standard. Thank you, Mark. Uh, good morning, afternoon, everybody. Um, so my name is Luca Tabarelli, and um, I work within the Neighbouring Rights team at Universal Music. Um, as Vanessa mentioned, I'm also co-chair of the, the DDEX RDR working group. Um, and really, uh, the way I was involved, I was the business partner for the, the project to implement uh, the RDR standard within Universal. Um, so my focus was very much on, you know, uh, make sure everyone understood the business benefits of, of implementing the standard. And we also had a, a technical team who worked on the, um, <clears throat> so on, on the technical side. But so my focus was very much on the um, on the benefits as a business. Um, now, as you can imagine, Universal being a multinational organisation, we had multiple ways of delivering our repertoire into each of the various societies around the world. Um, so we have over 60 offices, we had over 60 ways of delivering repertoire into a society and that ranged from uh, a direct feed, uh, it ranged from spreadsheets or online portals um, and so each opco had to kind of uh, create the files themselves and deliver that into their local society. Um, so for us the benefits of, of having a standardised message that could be applied across all of our offices is that it becomes much more efficient. It removes the need for each individual office to, to do that. And we can create one message centrally and then use that message to communicate our repertoire and our rights to all the relevant societies. So obviously these are you know early days and we, you know, we've got a handful of societies now that accept the message, but our kind of longer term goal really is for all our repertoire to be delivered via a DDEX message and move away from some of the manual work that we have to do, be it kind of creating spreadsheets, et cetera. So, so that was one of the benefits behind it. Um, the the DDEX message is also a much richer message than, than is ordinarily sent. So uh, not only do we have all the repertoire data, you know, that all the necessary data that the societies need to, to match and pay out on our repertoire, but it's also crucially includes all the rights information. And this is something that was often missing from our deliveries into the societies. Um, so the DDEX message includes our rights position on a territorial basis, on a rights basis. Uh, so the societies can see exactly which rights we're claiming for and for which territories. Again, it's a much more efficient message in terms of it's, it's much more encompassing. It, it contains a lot more information. Um, and finally, one thing I'll just say, and I'll, I'll let the others talk a bit as well, is that the crucial element is also this feedback loop that we get. So we, when we deliver a message into a society, we get a message back telling us the status of that registration. I, was it correctly ingested? Um, were there any errors? Uh, are there any conflicts? So we can very quickly see uh, the status of our registration, see if everything's OK. Uh, and if not, it allows us to fix those issues very early on rather than waiting 12 or 18 months further down the line when monies may have been held up in suspense or in, or in various accounts. So um, I just wanted to highlight those, those kind of the three primary benefits, I think, for a rights holder anyway, for implementing the DDEX standards. And I'm sure 
throughout the course of this panel, we'll, we'll talk more about some of the, uh, the challenges we faced throughout the, the implementation. Okay, Lucas, thanks very much. Uh, Mark, could you talk now from the perspective of an MLC in terms of um, your experience with the implementation of um, RDR notification standard? Thanks. Yes, uh, SAP is using for years the DDEX standards. Even before DDEX was created, we used the MI3P standard before. Uh, so all our communication with our members is made using DDEX standards, either because uh, they don't send us messages in DDEX format or because we supply them with the software that sent us data in the DDEX standards. We never had a significant problem with the standard themselves, uh, the different versions we, have, we, we use. Um, and when we when we use ourselves the standard to, to declare tracks to other MLCs, sister MLC outside of France, uh, normally these are, our data is very well ingested without difficulties because we have local rules um, linked with our legislations that uh, uh, made us uh, uh, to require high level quality uh, data since uh, we were created, you know, some in, in 1985. So we have a database. Uh, where with the requirements for high quality data is there for many years so when we send data to other territories the quality is there and so there's no problem mainly to ingest these data abroad uh, the, the constraints of that requirement local requirement is on the other side on the way side on the other way side, around when we receive data from other territories sometimes most of the time let me, most, most sometimes the data is not the right quality that we need so the difficulty is not with linked with the standard, it's, it's linked with the quality of the data. So I think what matters strongly, I think Luca is concerned by that too, uh, is the quality of the data that we, that we receive using the standards. If the quality is not there, then the standards is a magnificent tool, but we cannot do a lot of use with them. When the quality of the data is good, it's a wonderful tool. Uh, thank you, Mark. Um, good. Good to hear um, from a DDEX perspective. Um, Rob, can you talk about um, your experiences in at Beggars in terms of implementing uh, RDRN? Yeah, um, I can. And um, I, I think Luca already talked most of the um, benefits and the implications. And I think, I think the topic that Mark touched upon um, at his last remark with the quality of the data, that was a very important one for us. Um, we we um, we we were in a lucky position that um, we um, started developing a new database um, a couple of years ago, and um, as part of that, we were able to implement the uh, DDEX um, MLC 1.4 standard. Um, creating that and um, um, linking that also to RDX, which is for us very important. Uh, the Repertoire Data Exchange uh, by PPL, um, th that made us aware of the quality of the data. And um, although, you know, PPL always um, had beggars as an example of the high standard for the uh, data quality, we noticed that um, there was still a lot to fix. So doing a new database, combining that with the DDEX standard, made us um, cleanse our data, uh, which is very important for, well, all parties. It reduces conflicts. It um, makes sure, like Luca was saying, not always the correct right um, ownership data is was available at, at, at Universal. Well, you know, that, that happens everywhere. And um, for us, that was a very important tool um, or, or very important um, uh, addition to um, create this standard and use it. Okay, Rob, thanks very much. There seems to be a, a thread uh, emerging from, from these introductions, but we'll come back to the data quality issue later. Uh, Mike, from a MLC point of view, wh where did you see the, the benefits of, of adopting these standards and actually getting an implementation done? Uh, so ReSound receives thousands of repertoire submissions um, from not only the rights holders that we that we represent, but also our member collective, since we pretend as an umbrella collective. And so until we implemented DDEX, um, 
you know you can imagine just receiving all kinds of formats and in, 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 in uh, huge quantities and uh, that created challenges obviously in terms of data consistency but also in terms of automation it was hard to create systems that that manage that level of, uh, of sort of proprietary formats and so that was our main our drive to to uh, to implement edX um, but we were also a member of the testing team for the RDX project which Luca and Vanessa mentioned and so most of our implementation was driven by that project and I can say that uh, we did uh, ingest some some DDEX messages prior to that, but we never participated in the full choreography of the standard, which is a huge benefit for our rights holders. As Luca mentioned at the moment, um, well, prior to DDEX, if someone submitted repertoire to us, um, the only way that they could find out the status of that repertoire would be to uh, either visit our web portal or contact us directly, which is not always so um, reliable or timely, so it's great to now participate in the choreography aspect of the standard. Um, we're also developing a new distribution system at this time, which will go live early next year, and it gave us an opportunity to clean up and standardize all of the data in our own database. So um, a lot of the fields um, and, and, uh, and data points that we work with, um, we wanted to standardize those to, to feed into this new system, which will which will use DDEX in a, in a much wider scope since some of the integrations that we're implementing there are, um, are DDEX specific with our member collectives. They're using DDEX to exchange their data with us now rather than delivering um, sort of legacy formats and files. Um, so a lot of benefits, um, generally speaking, um, the, the, the top, the key benefits to us are providing more insight to our rights holders and, and to allow for automation in our systems. Stuart, can you just talk um, about RDRN from a PPL point of view, please? Yeah, sure. So, um, so um, my name is Stuart Fitzsimon. I'm the senior repertoire product manager at PPL, so within PPL's repertoire team. Um, and I think PPL first started working with um, with with the RDR standards, the MLC standard, as it was probably about ten years ago. And it was really um, as a way of, of declaring repertoire with other CMOS, both both two other CMOS and and from other CMOS to PPL. So ensuring that you know we could um, send repertoire information about. Um, our members that, um, and where we represented them around the world, sending that repertoire to to other societies, and then probably about three or four years ago, we started to do some development to receive repertoire from a small uh, small number of record companies. Um, obviously, some of them are, are on the call today, but um, really, really that work. Um, the, the development was done there to to allow PPL to receive repertoire in in um, in, in with. In it within a DDEX standard, but really it was act to, to act as like a precursor to the development that was ultimately going to be required by PPL to enable us to onboard to RDX um, as, as a recipient, as an, as an MLC, as a music licensing company. So if you think back to one of the, the slides Vanessa showed at the start, sort of we we're working with with the um, other societies on the left hand side of that slide, uh, and then we we're working with some of the, the record companies, the data sources on the right hand side. But all of that collectively was to to support the development um, to to enable PPL to to um, deliver um, responses back to RDX um, when we'd when we'd receive repertoire from RDX. So yeah, really really building building on the knowledge that we that we'd learned over the last few years of of, of sending. DDEX messages and receiving DDEX messages and being able to um, um, create request messages uh, and 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 send the rights claim status update message. All of that, all of that has allowed us to start to decommission some of the some of what we call legacy um, repertoire delivery methods. Some of the the ways that some record companies send repertoire data to PPL. Some of those methods are 20 years old, you know, they've, they've, and they've, they've not really been um, adapted. They're not, they're not really been evolved or changed um, within that time. So there's, there's, there's little, if any, validation on some of the repertoire data that comes in through some of those old methods. I think Rob and, and Luca both touched there on on quality and the, the like the importance of of data quality um, in, in what they're sending to to um, to um, societies to, to music licensing companies and that's that's crucial to PPL as well it's crucial for us to be able to ensure that you know we've got some kind of gate uh, on, on on the way in when repertoire comes into 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 the building because you know the the, the 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 less the quality of the repertoire data the much harder it is for us to to match any airplay that's reported to us by by licensees and radio stations and so on so yeah ensuring that ensuring that the using the ddex standards there's there's that level of validation 
from the quality of repertoire that data that comes in and in turn through the rights claim status update message enabling us to report back on that quality to the to the data sources to allow them to see um, the registration status whether something is valid or invalid as per our data policy and whether there's a conflict crucially allow, allowing them to have earlier visibility of conflicts um, that, that, that their repertoire might have within PPL's repertoire system that they otherwise wouldn't get told about until we do a dispute campaign every you know twice a, twice a year every six months or something like that so yeah really it brings it brings forward it brings upstream um, uh, the, 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 the visibility around validation quality of repertoire data and, 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 and complex code okay Stuart thanks very much it's very clear from what you've all said that actually in some ways the standard itself is not the issue or the implementation of it um, but it's uh, the, 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 the core of this is data quality, and I'll, I'll come back to that a little later on. Um, I'd like to now open it up to everybody uh, on the call. Uh, as we're a relatively small group, I think it's fine if, you, if you've got a question, just turn your microphone and, and screen on so that we can see you um, and, and ask your question, and I'm sure the panel will do what they can to respond. So has anybody... Uh, got some questions or a question they'd like to ask uh Torben, you've got your, your yeah mic yeah i have a i have a question regarding the rdr r standard how many has implemented that and have a what is the experience about uh, rdr r the flat file format so, so I turn to Rod on this one because I think you at PPL have been responsible for the RDR. Uh, Rod, off to you, over to you. Yeah, so we've been uh, we ran a trial uh, this year, so um, working with uh, Beggars uh, Universal uh, Sound Exchange, um, basically, yeah, a, a trial. So uh, we were able to to generate generate the radar R message, um, and then uh, yeah sent that over to uh, to Universal and Beggars. Um, they were able to ingest it, no problem. So, you know, I think um, in terms of the complexity of it, it was, you know, it was it was fairly straightforward. Um, yeah, there, there's kind of a, a structure to it in terms of, you know, headers, summary records, detailed records. Um, so there's a little bit of, uh, you know, complexity in kind of constructing those. Um, but you know, from our perspective, um, you know, we send revenue statements to to, to members. Um, so it's really that next kind of step where we can standardise those revenue statements. So not only sending you know to rights holders or to performers as well, so that the standard's flexible enough to to cater for both. Um, but we can also send it to other MLCs in terms of you know our international collections and mandates that we have. So um yeah so so i think overall the trial was was successful we were able to to feedback some you know you know some additional changes um that we would need um to, to give us a bit more you know a bit more detail in the standard but it's quite flexible you know you can um specify sort of revenue at the at the recording level um or at, you know at the at the rights holder or performer level as well so um it's flexible enough to kind of um cater for different um you know different distribution granularities if you like um de you know depending on the level that you uh you generate uh, revenue um statements at so okay well yeah thanks very much yeah. well, does, that, does, that, does that help Torben? uh yes it does i have a uh, uh do do ddex have other flat 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 file for 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 formats that uh are Okay, thanks, Torben. Um, I think I'll turn to Niels on this one because um, it's more his line of country. Niels, hi there. Um, hi, uh, Tom. Um, hi. Yes, we do. Um, there are a number of flat files that we've developed. Traditionally, DDX does XML because most of the data is st is properly structured. Um, so you have a sound recording containing musical works, which is then embedded in a release. All of that kind of things really lends itself to to structure data uh, and xml is a is a language for that but when it comes to tabular data um as vanessa has said um you lose a lot of um especially numbers 
uh, you lose a lot of um, bandwidth to tags if you're using um, XML. So we went with um, flat file for those things. Um, the first people to do that were the um, for this it was the DSR, the digital sales reporting uh, folks. That's sales reporting mostly to works licenses. Um, and the DSR standard was the first that went, um, and it uses the same architecture as, as Radar R. And that is uh, six, seven years ago now that they went um, and, and the, the file size has collapsed from um, by a factor of 20 from uh, compared to the to the XML variant, uh, which I think nobody uses anymore. Um, based on that experience, the radar working group decided to do the same for the for the reporting here. Um, and a third one is the BWARM standard. Um, that uh, is a standard developed um, used by the well by the MLC. In this case, the Mechanical Licensing Collective in the US. Um, Can you explain is, the acronym, Niels, please? I, I was just about to do that. Okay, my apologies. And, <laughs> Uh, BWARM is, is, uh, stands for Bulk Message for Work and Recording Metadata. It's a standard um, that, that the Music Licensing Collective, the Mechanical Licensing Collective sends out to um, companies about all the stuff that they store in their database. Um, but it's a database dump, so it's a slightly different flat file than the ones that we're talking about here. But Radar R and the DSR and the CDM, the claim detail message, which is the response to a um, sales report in the musical works licensing world, is also flat file. So these three or four are flat files. Okay, Niels, thanks very much. Does anybody else have any uh, questions they'd like to ask? Actually, sorry, Mark, I just want to maybe add something sure. with regards to, to the Radar R standard and and also to Torben's, you know, just about the fact that it's a flat file. I mean, the thing with Radar R is, is it's a standalone standard, so it doesn't need to be implemented along with the notification standard. Um, different MLCs are at different levels of technical ability, and I think with the reporting, you know, with the revenue reporting standard, I think it needs to be as accessible as possible to as wide a range of societies as possible. I think. It could be a relatively straightforward step for societies who already kind of create flat file um, reporting files anyway. Okay, the idea is, is that if they're doing that, then this is just a way of standardizing that format. So we have an agreed set of fields that they may not be able to complete straight away at the beginning, but at least then it's something that they can aspire to to try and give us as rich a, um, a revenue file as possible. So things like um, you know, the type of revenue, be it public broadcast or television or radio, which we often don't see on a statement, or whether, you know, make sure that at least there's a field for the RSRC, which again, we don't always get. Um, so I think keeping it as a flat file, just, you know, hopefully it will encourage more societies to be able to use it rather than have something which is, would be technically more, not necessarily difficult, but just would require a bit more work on their side to, to create that kind of file. So. I think that's why also the flat file for this for revenue reporting I think works well um, across all across all the societies. Okay, Luca, thanks for that. Uh, Simon, you have your camera and microphone on. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you. Um, uh, hi everyone. So I'd, I'd just be interested to um, if the panel could drill in in a bit more depth about data quality and um, the consequences uh, of um, using the RDR end message, uh, what impact and, and the consequences on record companies' uh, uh, repertoire and rights data. Um, at, at Warner's, we spent the last year or so um, working on um, implementing the RDR end standard and so just be really good to hear from those who have gone live with it and done it what uh, what their views on that are yeah thanks simon i think um the panel's all mentioned the data quality i think it would be useful to get a better handle on where the problems are around the data quality is it 
the yeah. description, the descriptive data around uh, the actual repertoire, or or is it information about the rights? Where where are the where do the problems or even the performers in some cases? I appreciate that's not applicable for everybody, um, but where where are, where do the, the the issues lie? Let's perhaps start with the record companies. Rob, can you drill down to that first of all? Yeah, definitely. Um, so. Um, as, as I mentioned, um, when we uh, 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 implemented our new database at Bagus, um, we um, started off with um, an incredibly amount of data cleansing. Um, internally, we um, started uh, developing standards like um, uh, uh, re release dates cannot be before creation dates, um, stuff like that on, on a recording. Um, and so a recording cannot be on a release that has a release date earlier than the creation date of the recording. Stuff like that. We, we implemented all these rules in our uh, system just to check whether our data uh, was, was valid at all. Um, and, and then um, going through that, you know. Um, so Rob, was this legacy data or just uh, just from the date forward it was it, it was a clear um, it, it it was legacy data well we implemented it entirely in our database system it's still there so if someone creates now a new recording it can it it it, it still has to comply with all these um data quality rules that we have internally um but we also uh, implemented that for all uh, legacy data um, where um, we, we had to reevaluate you know country of recording uh, do we have that correct do we have that in our system do we have it correctly in our system um, do we have places of recording do we have uh, contributors for those recordings um, all, all those we created I think I think we created about 20 30 different data quality rules that um if if it, it did not match those data quality standards we were not even able to send it as a ddex mlc message because it was not valid you know it would have got rejected anyway by um by, by anyone who received that type of ddex message so we probably spent about well more over a year um do, doing all that data cleansing it, uh, through the various uh, departments um sometimes even going back you know to the individual uh, uh, agreements um and, and the other thing is you know um end dates we never entered end dates in our database system because you know uh, you, you created an excel file to uh, register your recordings with a uh, collecting society but but you never send an update on that um, it was not really possible to send an update you can you can register a recording but you cannot update a recording through excel files um, so um, ha having to deal with all of a sudden being able to update quality data quality or data that we sent to uh, collecting societies that was a very important one um for us and um that also now that we for instance have rdx where all the um where, where at the moment universal and sony and, and and warner about to start delivering data into you get one place where you know um data must be correct because it's being matched between you know is there no overlap in start date and end date between the different um companies um and uh, you, uh, I, I, th I think um, i see that intergram for instance is on this um, call as well i just um got reported the uh, conflicts from intergram between beggars and other companies amongst others universal where i'm i'm just like really surprised that we have conflicts between the two companies because if we look at our rdx data there are hardly any um, overlapping claims between Universal and Beggars. So in RDX, it's just all solved. That means in our core database, it is solved. And um, for, 
for some reason at um, the various MLCs, uh, local companies still report different data from what um, the, the central hub is uh, reporting between the manual and the DDEX standards going into RDX. I think, uh, thanks, Rob. I mean, what, what that sort of tends to hint at is that the introduction of the standard and more particularly the RDX hub has really kind of forced the labels to look very carefully at their data um, and do something to improve it. So, so Mark, perhaps from a from an MLC point of view, what are the the, the data to sort of answer Simon's question? Where where are the data problems that you experience, both in terms of coming from your members, but also from other MLCs? No naming names, oh. please, but just the types of problems. Sometimes some some information is clearly invalid because you mentioned if the date of creation uh, uh, is after the date of release, obviously there's a problem. These kind of issues, obviously uh, when we see that kind of that, it is blocked. We don't ingest it in our system. Um, it's one of them, but the uh, other things like we need some specific information because of legislation on the place of recording, the country of recording, on the nationality of the first producer of the recording. This data is not required by many MLCs. It is required locally here because of French law. Um, so that data is very often missing in the database. And the, but the most frequent problem that we have is what we call double claims. The fact that somebody has rights for France and has declared the track to us, and then the original owner also declared the tracks to us while he has licensed the right to somebody else. And he has not, not taken that in that database, in his database. So double claims because some tracks are licensed locally uh, with the right local right holder, there's already a member of CEP already has declared the tracks. Uh, we have these double claims that block the rights to for everybody. Uh, that can be a, a huge problem because uh, uh, in case of double claims, we don't pay any right holder. Okay, <clears throat> sorry. Okay, Mark, thanks very much. I mean, it sounds as if actually using the standard does help expose some of these these data problems. Um, so hopefully that that's that's a good thing. Um, Luca, I don't, Luca or Stuart, I don't know if there's anything you want to add to what Rob and Mark have just said. I mean, I, I, I just kind of kind of iterate what Rob said about about how it's made us take another look at our own data. Um, unfortunately, we weren't in the luxurious position of developing a new database, so we've had to make do with the uh, the, the databases that we have. But it, it's it's partly, you know, it's an education process as well for. Um, our rights and repertoire teams and particularly for new repertoire we, we've undertaken a, a huge program of just ensuring that for all the people responsible for label copy information repertoire information they understand the data that's necessary and we've and we've introduced you know mandatory fields now that previously weren't there so you know like mark said country of recording um is, is absolutely essential for us to be paid in, in certain in certain countries and you know for a lot of our teams for a lot of the the a and r teams you know when we're creating your repertoire this the main focus was just to, let's just get it out to the digital platforms it's all about streaming and neighboring rights was always a bit of an afterthought and wasn't really fully understood and people never really understood why we needed this information and so we just showed them the financial impact of not adding that information so if you don't add country recording It'll be rejected by by RDX, and it won't make its way through to be it PPLs or resounds or, or whoever's database. So it was really making sure all the teams responsible for creating the metadata around the repertoire understood not only what fields to, but not only what data we needed, but why we needed it. So I think that's the key: is to they understand that this has a financial impact if you don't fill in the data correctly right at the source of creation. It's really at, at as far upstream as possibly we can do it. Um, and then, you know, similarly on the right side as well, let's not forget that, you know, it was also for our, for our legal teams to make sure that, you know, when we do digital distribution deals, do we have the neighboring rights for that or not? Because quite often it's always an afterthought. We'd do a distribution deal and we would never capture whether we had the neighboring rights or not. And I think this would quite often lead to issues like Rob was saying all of a sudden, we're registering repertoire where we just had a digital only deal, but we've assumed we've had enabling rights as well. And that just created so much noise 
and inefficiency at societies where all of a sudden we're in conflict where and it's on us it's, you know sometimes it was our fault because we're registered and repertoire that we didn't have the rights for so again this this forces people to really understand what rights do we have where do we have them let's articulate those rights in our own systems and then they all flow through the ddex messages and then we don't have these problems you know and and so it's all about reducing the inefficiencies and and stopping monies being held up as societies it sounds to me like it forced different departments within umg to talk to each other which in my experience is a first um, yeah you know it's we've, we've met people we've never met before in this exercise and it's uh, but it's true you know it's you know everything was very siloed beforehand Every, you know the right teams worked on their bit the repertoire on their bit and each each territory each country worked on their own side so this has really been a you know a cross-functional cross-territory project and it and it's it's been beneficial uh, but it's also highlighted a lot of areas where we had to improve um and you know sometimes it, it's you know be careful what you wish for because we all wanted this and it, it's it's great that it's happened but it it, it has caused us to change quite a few of our uh, internal processes but but for the better rob and uh, mike i think both mentioned this rob for sure about the, about the uh, impact on data quality and that's something that I, I i'd like to hear a little bit more about it's it sounds like part of what stuart was talking about the feedback loop is in fact what we we sometimes call the pool filter over time it sounds like by using this the repertoire data is going to the, the quality of the repertoire data is going to increase or improve do i have the right impression here um yes david definitely um so, sorry mike <laughs> um um yeah well I, I i can state that for for beggars we have um um drawn in our legacy data into the new database and um and also for the quality of the new data we um developed uh a whole series of um, validation rules within our oh dear rob seems to have mike do you want to step in because obviously i think he's, he's sure, yeah down. um well i know i know that that, that rob during the uh, onboarding process to to rdx and lots of other participants in rdx had to go through uh, a lot of data cleansing, as he mentioned, and in order to obviously meet the the, the, the standards requirements, um, uh, some data in your system would have to be cleaned up. But when we talk about RDX as well, there's an RDX um, core data profile and there's a set of validation rules on RDX as a service, which sort of further standardize or, or further create requirements for, for the data. And so um, in terms of cleaning up uh, data in your own system that's that was that was sort of the driving force at least for us from that perspective but i'd also like to point out that the um the for example if we get performer data from a record label which we didn't used to in the past we can use this data which we do now in our new system to improve matching which is an enormous challenge for any music licensing company i think and the more and more we get more fulsome data um, by way of the standard the better our matches become, the better the feedback, and the quicker the feedback is to the record labels, and therefore that sort of creates an action on their side to improve data in their own system. So it's this constant circle of yeah, improvements. Yeah, okay. that's, yeah, that was exactly my, my question. Rob was addressing almost like the prep preparatory data cleanup, but, but this is what I'm more interested in, is that by entering into the system over time, it forces forces i don't know but enables the cleanup of the data so that's great we're getting a good idea that one of the not the side effects but i suppose actually one of the objectives is that we're now constantly trying to improve data quality luca do you want to go first and then then yeah i mean it? maybe just to back up what what rob and pascal were saying and it's um you know i said earlier on it, it's you know it's be careful what you wish for and we wanted we wanted to implement the DDEC standard. We wanted to implement radar, radar N. Um, but because now it references both our repertoire data and our rights data, it really puts a lot more um, kind of pressure on us to make sure that all that data is up to date and accurate and clean. 
Um, and part of it has been within Universal, it's been an education process for the people who enter that data, um, be it on the label copy side or on the right side. Um, so we spent um, the past couple of years making sure that all the, the interested parties are aware of, of what kind of data is required. These fields are now mandatory in our label copy system, things like country of recording, uh, country of financing, all those kind of things that allow RFR to be paid out by society. Um, so it's really been a bit of a journey for us in terms of educating the various teams into, into how to do this and, and why to do it, because there's always a financial benefit to getting that data right in the first place. Um, so again, very much very similar to the experience that, that beggars have gone through. Okay, great. Kat Katia, you put your camera and mic on for a moment. Do you, do you have a question? Yeah, my question for was for the MLCs, that, uh, what are the volumes of data that you are receiving in radar and messages and how do you manage ingestion? Stuart, thank you Katja. Yeah, I can, I can definitely answer that one. So I suppose the, the, well, the, the volumes vary greatly um, and I suppose there's, there's, there's two aspects to, 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 to that volume question. There's a, there's a question about the volume of, um, of claims within the message. So how many recordings do, 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 does each message contain? <clears throat> and that might be that there's one recording per message. It might be 40, it might be 500. So that really there's a bit of a spectrum there. There's no, there's no hard and fast rule as to how many recordings you, you can put into a message. But obviously the more recordings you put in, the more additional metadata that brings with it. So additional performer lineups of uh, product information, host, host sound carrier information, um, obviously the territorial rights. The, the more recordings, the, 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 the more rows of information within each message. Um, and then there's the actual volume of, of, of recordings itself. So, so it, you know, each time PPL receives a, a batch delivery of repertoire. And that's, that's varied quite significantly. I think, um, you know, if in, in some instances from some record companies, it might just be 40 recordings every every now and again. You know, it might be, you know, their, their, their monthly releases or something like that. But if I think back to, to when PPL was receiving data directly from from Universal, for example, we would potentially get thousands of recordings a day um, in um, batches of maybe 100, 150, 200 messages, 200 declaration messages um, that, that we would process. We'd process everything on a nightly basis, and then the next day there would be another another <laughs> kind of delivery there. So it's you know, the volumes. The volumes can 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 vary. Um, if I think of of some of the work that we've done with with RDX throughout this year, um, we might receive maybe maybe 1,000, 2,000 new recordings each week from some of the data sources that are onboarded to RDX. So, um, uh, you know, and, and, and that's kind of the new repertoire, the new releases, recordings that are, are being put out now in, in 2021. But then there's some targeted work that we've done um, with, with, with some of those data is to to request a back catalog things that they've put into RDX that they might have never sent to PPL directly because they never needed to send them to, to PPL directly or they were never set up to send it to PPL directly so some of their international repertoire or some of the video releases things that just you know, never been sent to us before and so as a result we've 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 I think we've picked up maybe another 200,000 or so recordings this year from RDX that we were unable to kind of access before before we were able to, 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 to draw that from RDX. So yeah, the volumes can be quite small on a regular basis, but there's the scope there for 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 much larger volumes if 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 you wish or you know and if you if you have the infrastructure and if you if you're able to to process that, that those kind of volumes so yeah really really fluctuates but the standard the standard allows for that i would say um it's 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 not it's not um it's it, it's not tied into any kind of limits on on how many recordings you can put in a message you just have to consider that ultimately the bigger the message the harder it might be to 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 to, to open up you know and, and to, if, if you want to interrogate it and look at it um, so yeah, there's just considerations around that, but the standard itself allows for allows for for, for for vast volumes within the message and potentially vast volumes of messages per batch. Okay, thanks. So we've got another question in the chat from FX, and I might throw this one to Niels because he's more likely to know the answer off by heart than anybody else. Which is, does the standard define the mandatory or highly recommended fields? Well, the, the radar notification standard certainly has um, these uh, uh, two different profiles. One that allows you to communicate um, the data that is required uh, to, to register a claim and one that is required to register a claim and actually also get um, paid. 
Um, now, when I say required, it's not entirely um, hard and fast because different territories have different rules. Um, so we have tried to come um, to some kind of a um, list of fields that would help in, in, in most um, territories. Uh, this does not apply to the radar, not uh, radar reporting standard. There is a number of fields that are mandatory and a number of fields that are that are um, that, that are optional and depending on the, the business case. Um, but for the notification standard, yes, we do have them and they are listed on the knowledge base under the, the radar um, and under the radar landing page. And we have provided them for both the 1.4 version, which is the, the current one, um, and as well as the 1.5 version, which is published, but not that much used at, at, at this stage. Is that what you were talking about, FX? Um, I hope then that that answers the question. Uh, not, then. Yeah, close enough. I was actually uh, making reference to Pascal's comment when she said that, for instance, the Euro recording was not much used before, but now it's getting more integrated into the standard. So I was wondering if there were other like good practices that were coming to life because of the radar standard. Um, I think so, yes. I think in that case, um, you were talking about the radar notification standard and you would then have these two profiles. One that really is the minimum data that you that you need to have to, to get anywhere. However, some music licensing companies may not be able to then pay out based on that data. Unless, of course, they receive that information from some, some, some un, from other routes, for example. Maybe somebody else makes the claim claim for the same sound recording just in a different territory, but now they they have the the complete set and they may be able to pay out. But ideally, you would provide the information in the um, in, in the larger profile, the one that gives you the recommended profile, I think it's called, um, that gives you the information right on the top. And it's that information I think that Pascal was referring to. They are now and not just them, but the, the labels that are actually working on the and, and integrating with RDX. And they're all working towards providing all that information going forward and going backwards. And it's going the backwards, going through the history. That's, I think, the um, the challenge. Look, and, and I, think, no, I think, Niels, just, just, just to build on that, really, it's, it's where we found um, this really useful, it's particularly with legacy data, um, and particularly for acquired catalogues, um, where perhaps the quality of the data is patchy at best of times. And what we're finding is as we're delivering um, this updates to this old data, we're starting to see through the RC sum, through that feedback loop, it very quickly tells us where there's information missing. Sorry, and sorry Luca, RC sum, please explain. Right, the, the rights claim status update message. So it's the, it's the message that comes back to us when we deliver the radar N, we then get a message back telling us the status of that registration. Um, and it will give us the, if there's an error, it will also give us the severity of that error. So if it's an error, which is so severe that actually the recipient can't ingest it, in other words, it will be rejected, um, then we know that's something that's it's, it's of a high priority for us to fix. And it could be that there's data missing, like a country of recording, for example, is a mandatory field for a number of societies. And for a lot of our legacy data, that field is actually missing. Um, so it means it allows us to go back and clean up our, our historical data, add in the country of recording, and then it just gets sent out on the next, when the next feed is, it could be the next day or the next week. So it forces, in a way, it kind of forces us to retrospectively clean up our data um, just, just by going through this process. Okay, so thanks. One one thing I've been sort of storing in my mind as we've been talking is we've mentioned it several times, RDX, another acronym. I imagine most of the people on the call probably know what it is, but Stuart, could you just give a quick explanation of what RDX is so that we can give some context to, to the, the comments we've made, please? Thank you. Sure. So, so RDX stands for the Repertoire Data Exchange. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a centralised repertoire hub. Effectively, think back to Vanessa's slide at the start. It was sort of down 
on the down the middle of the slide between the data sources on one side and the MLCs, the music licensing companies, on, on the other. Um, and it is a way of, I think Luca, Luca touched on it, it's a way of sending repertoire to one place rather than having to send repertoire to 50 different places in 50 different ways. Those 50 different, 50 different formats, they've all got certain different requirements. Well, RDX is a, is, is, a, is, a, is a centralized hub built using the DDX standards. Um, it's, 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 it's built on top of the, the declaration message, the request message, the rights claim status update message. And um, if you're a record company, a data source, or, or a music licensing company, and you have the, the capability to, to send and receive these messages, then you can send your data to RDX. RDX will, will send it on to MLCs around the world that are, that are signed up to it. Um, it was something that was kind of commissioned by the IFPI and WIN on behalf of the, the, the majors and the indies and, and, and the societies around the world. And it was designed and, and built by PPL and PPL now kind of operates it, it administers it on an ongoing basis. Um, but yeah, really the, the, there's, there's, there's about three or four data sources on board uh, at the moment, three or four um, licensing companies as well. And there's a number more that are due to kind of um, finish testing probably early in, in 2022 and, and go live. So we anticipate the number of um, data sources and, and music licensing companies will, will certainly grow in 2022. Uh, and really it's a way of, of, of of, of uh, allowing that centralized conflict detection. I think one, it was either Rob or, or Luca mentioned it about knowing that well, well, there, there are conflicts. If there are conflicts in RDX and you resolve them, then that should allow those conflicts to be, you know, be resolved out to, to, the, to the licensing companies that are requesting that repertoire data as well. Um, yeah, so it just allow, allows that centralized um, conflict detection as well as um, allowing um, music licensing companies to, to take repertoire on, on, the, on the schedule that they require it, whether that's daily, whether it's weekly or monthly, process it locally, and then respond back to RDX and out to the data sources on the quality of, of, the, of the registrations uh, and, the, and, the, and the scope of any conflicts locally at, at their societies as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, Simon, have you got another question? Yeah, I just wanted to uh, follow up on what Stuart was saying about the um, uh, conflict resolution maybe here from um, uh, the labels and uh, MLCs on what actually happens the process uh, and the impact for uh, when a uh, duplicate registrations are received in RDX from two different rights owners and uh, you know okay. what happens really okay thank you Rob do you want to start on that I'm sure the others will have something to say yeah, definitely. Um, well, um, so as, as, as soon as any receiving party from a DDAX message receives a second claim on the same ISRC, that will trigger um, uh, that will trigger a response in the sense that there is a double claim. Um, that double claim will be communicated back in the RC sum, the rights. Uh, uh, communication uh, summary update message what is it yeah um, and um, in in that message it will state the reason for the conflict it will state whether there's um, overlapping countries whether there's overlapping uh, time period um, whether it's just a, a generally overlapping claim on, on, on everything. Um, it will it will state the different um, values for which there is uh, a conflict. The um, I, I think the beauty of this is that you don't correct it locally. So um, there are MLCs that work with us a database, and then you know they say these are the recordings got airplay this year. Here, here are the conflicts and then you solve the conflicts and next year because the database does not change the conflict just happens again and again and again every year um, and if, if, if you have the wrong data you can have um, uh, the same conflict in for instance Italy, UK, Ireland, Czech Republic, everywhere and, and have to work with the local people who um, uh, deal with the conflicts locally. Um, the, the, the beauty if you have um, 
the messages to send to RDX is that RDX immediately in that central hub detects the duplicate claim, the conflict. You change the data in your own local database. You send it back again to um, RDX and the conflict is clear. Uh, and, and then it gets cleared with all the um, participating MLCs that uh, are part of RDX. Okay, thank you. Uh, do Stuart or Mark want to add anything to that from an MLC point of view? Um, you yes, know, I suppose. And one of the problems that we, that, that we have, because the, uh, uh, the originator of the declaration database, if it's not amended after the Brooklyn has been identified, uh, we, re we sometimes, you know, we correct in our database the, the data, there's no double claims anymore, and then the same right holder that declared wrongly some tracks to us is doing it again because his own database has not been updated. That's the main issue that we have, you know, recurring double claims. While they have been identified, uh, they still could pop up because the original database of the rights have not been updated. That's the main big problem because, you know, as soon as we have a double claim, as, as mentioned, we don't pay the right holder anymore. The, the right one and, and the wrong one. Okay, thank you. Luca, I, I guess you've been through that sort of, um, you know, challenge yourself, whereas historically each of our co operating companies would most ma maintain their own database of recordings for their territory. We're increasingly looking at moving to a centralized global view. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's absolutely right, Simon. And actually, on, on the back of, of really RDX and the fact that we're getting these um, reports back, the, uh, the update messages, <clears throat> we're actually developing a tool within Universal to aggregate all the conflicts that we get from, from all the different MLCs into one centralized, like you say, Simon, into one centralized. Um, kind of database, if you will, uh, which allows us really to, to resolve one conflict just the once. So the same conflict will appear in quite often in multiple territories because it's the same kind of dirty data being sent throughout sent to all the MLCs. So the idea is that we resolve that conflict once and once only, and then we disseminate all that updated information to all the recipients on be it on RDX or whoever's getting that DDEX feed. So it, it's, it's a much more efficient way of, of handling conflicts. Stuart, did you have something to add on that? Got your mic yeah, open. I, I was going to add that. I was going to add that from a from a from a music licensing company's perspective. You know, I, we we can see I, I can see through through having um, onboarded to RDX as, as a recipient. So, so we take repertoire data out of it, RDX, we process it locally. We might find a conflict again, you know, between one of the RDX data sources and one of our local members. Um, and we'll feed that back via the claims, rights claims data update message. And then we, we can see that some of those conflicts then get resolved by the data source through either through them updating their right start dates, end dates, through the territories, through re revoking their rights completely. So through using the revoke message um, that they're able to send to to RDX, and that's and that that, that kind of whole, whole whole process works without without me or you know without someone at PPL needing to run a report, needing to send an email, needing to pick up the phone and get in touch with someone because the the, the, the whole the whole the, the the whole infrastructure is there such that the 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 message from the data source to the MLC, back to the data source, back to the MLC, it can get the, these conflicts can get resolved without anybody need, really needing to kind of manually step in and, and, and do something and amend something internally. So yeah the real the real benefits of of using all the all the various messages within the suite are that um, you know over over time we can see start, start to see less less need for so many kind of ad hoc processes really and that's because that's where the that's where the ultimately the, the inefficiencies come from is just kind of doing doing it for ad hoc bespoke processes for you know iteratively over and over and over again. Mary, you've been waiting patiently with your camera on. Do you want to ask a question? Sure. Um, I am still. I do still find the whole DDEX thing a little overwhelming, so <laughs> bear with me. Um, sure. But I have I have noticed uh, throughout the, like I wear a small independent label, uh, Anthem Records, and we are directly affiliated with multiple CMOs uh, worldwide. Something we've noticed a lot is there are conflicts between 
the licensing companies. Like, you know, there'll be a conflict between Sound Exchange and PPL. And I'm wondering, like, is ERDR, is like Radar and um, RDX, or is that something that will help eliminate these inter licensing company conflicts? Because I'm not quite sure how that occurs. <laughs> Sure. Um, Michael, um, Stuart, do you want to have a go at that? Yeah. Hi, Murray. Good to see Hi. you. Yeah. <laughs> um, Murray and I used to work together. A long time um, ago. <laughs> yeah. um, so I can say that at the moment, we Resound does does not use um, uh, RDX or 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 DDEX to communicate co those kinds of conflicts from MLC to MLC. Although it's definitely something that we are looking at and that the standard can support. Um, so I think it's really a, a matter of what, what the music licensing company um, is using the standard for and, and whether, you know, whether there's agreement obviously on both sides to, to share that kind of information between companies. Um, yeah, so so we we're we're an RDX recipient at the moment, but we are investigating becoming an RDX data source on behalf of our smaller members. Um, in which case, we would we would flush out the the um, the full declaration messages, which would enable us to communicate that kind of information to other MLCs. That's where we are with that. So not just yet, but maybe in the future. I think it's probably just worth pointing out that at the moment there's only I don't know about half a dozen companies, MLCs and record companies that are fully engaged in RDX. In other words, they're receiving and sending messages. But as that comes, as that expands, and there's a long queue of people, as I understand it, who who want to onboard to RDX, then the sort of problem that you just described, Mary should start to filter out because the process of back and forth information and confirmation of data and data conflicts will just you know be communicated to a broader and broader uh, group of people and that should start to 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 filter out the sorts of areas that you're talking about mm -hmm. but you know it it's not going to be a hundred companies overnight. It takes time to onboard. It takes time for them to exchange data and then to deal with the errors and the conflicts and so on and so on. So, it's it. but I think the ultimate goal of RDX is very much to 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 sort out exactly the sort of thing that you're talking about. Stuart, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I was going to say just to do there's there's a comment in the chat. From, from William Gary at Tune Registry. So he says that would those conflicts be centered around mandates? And, and I suppose almost certainly it will be uh, a, be a belief by two different music licensing companies that they have the right to collect on behalf of a record company in a, in a territory. And that's what will have caused that conflict. So yeah, more often than not, it will be um, an MSC acting in, in what they believe is you know, the, the interest of, of their member to try and collect that revenue on, on, on their member's behalf. Um, I think it's probably it's probably worth clarifying though, that when, when we do talk about conflicts in in, in and some of the language we, we've used today and some of the um, terminology we've used when we're talking about conflicts, we are specifically talking about right to conflicts. But um, to, 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 to William's point there, um, it's it's quite likely that that right to conflict was 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 triggered through whatever effectively is a mandate conflict, what effectively is a licensing company believing that they have the right to collect in territory A and another society believing they have all the right to collect in territory A as well. So yeah, that, that's, quite, that's quite often the, the, the kind of the cause of some of those um, inter-licensing company conflicts. Um, a question maybe for Stuart, uh, so around, around uh, validation, data validation. So um, a DDEX file is, is validated against the DDEX schema, but I don't know if you could give some examples um, a valid data validation that happens when the file gets um, processed on your end. Yes, yeah, so I suppose that probably comes back to uh, and uh, kind of something that I touched on earlier around the, the way that we are, the way the way that we've hey, historically, the way that we've had to kind of. Um, uh, convert a DDEX message to something to the, to the to the bespoke PPL um, infrastructure in order to process it. So for you know we weren't able to just load a DDEX message into our database. We don't have the capability for that. So we had to convert it, and, and as such, 
a lot of the time we find error messages or, or challenges arising it's not from the contents of the ddex message so much it's from the from the from the, from the existing infrastructure from that legacy method that we're having to kind of shoehorn it in to kind of force it through uh, and obviously that that Proves a, proves a challenge. I, I can understand that you know would have had to mm. report that back to, 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 to data sources like yourself in the past. If if you think of um, and, and really that's because we're, we're as I say we're we're, we're forcing a DDX message through a through a message uh, through, through a system that wasn't really designed to process it. If we look at RDX, where which is a system that was built you you know built on the on the on the on the infrastructure, the DDX RDR standard um, is 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 the, is, the, is the infrastructure on which RDX is built. We don't have that. We don't have that challenge. We have, uh, you know, you have you know, various levels of validation um, at the point that a data source sends data to RDX. It either, you know, it might, it might not even make it into RDX. It might make it into RDX, but then it, um, it you know, might might sort of make it no further. It, it might make it from from RDX out to a date uh, out to a, a music licensing company, but then be invalid uh, and flagged as, as an invalid registration at the music licensing company, and that can get fed back to the data source. But at least in that instance, it's still been registered at the, at the MLC. It's still available for matching. Um, we can start to accrue any kind of airplay that might get reported by a licensee. We can attribute that to to the recording. So these various kind of I suppose you can imagine it like like peeling back the layers of an onion. You've got the we, we've touched already about the core profile and the and the recommended profile. Within that, there's also the RDX operational profile, which is kind of a set of rules that kind of sit somewhere between the core and the recommended. And then there's a set of best practice rules as well, which are it's not going to stop the, the 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 validity of a registration, but it's just kind of more common sense approach and kind of you know things that things that make sense. So. The, the, the standard the standard allows us for these kind of various different tiers I suppose of validation uh, and for for claims to kind of pass through certain levels depending on kind of the severity of, of, of those errors and it allows for MLCs to be fairly descriptive in the in the, in the feedback that they provide back in the rights claim status update message about those errors PPL in particular has some very um, you know we have some 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 data quality, um, we, we have a data policy um, and it has some rules around performer lineups. Well, those rules only really apply to PPL. I don't I don't believe that any other MLC has those requirements written in, in, in that kind of way. But the standard allows us to report those back to a data source via RDX um, as, a, as a PPL operational profile. Um, and it's just another kind of benefit of, of the implementation of the of the of the RDR standard and, and, and using the functionality that comes with the rights claim status update message that allows us to be that kind of specific about um, this is this is an error, this is an issue that you might want to deal with or you might need to deal with but it only applies to your registration at PPL and it just gives you kind of the the, the visibility of um, you know as a whole where has your repertoire been delivered to from RDX where has it been delivered to and kind of what are the local issues or conflicts that, that, that you, you get reported back using those standards. We're coming to the end of our time now. Are, are there any other questions um, from attendees? Okay. Um, in that case, um, I'll just ask the panel if there's anything you want to add as a, a final message to everybody, and um, then we'll draw ourselves to a close. Rob? Yeah, maybe maybe just for the labels that are on here, um, there there is some technical implication of um, the message, the DRC sum you get back from de declaring a recording. Um, so, for instance, you you uh, may have the invalids, the conflicts, all those things. You have to be able because you get them in an, in a DDEX message, which is not easily readable. You have to be able to extract that to uh, a, a way that you can process it that you can do something with it that you can make sense of it um, and that does make take some technical um, um, development okay so you need a certain amount of expertise um, is there any any other comments the the other three of you want three or four of you want to make before we finish yeah, I mean, I just yeah, just on the back of what. Sorry, sorry. No, Luke heard. Luke heard. Just on the back of what Rob said, it's there are you know from from a labels perspective, there are IT technical implications, but you know we've always viewed this more as a business initiative rather than an IT project in terms of 
the benefits for a label in just in increased efficiency, much richer data, and ultimately more revenue flowing back into the labels, which is, is, is the key thing for this. Okay, and Stuart? I was just going to say that you kind of don't don't underestimate that that you know that there will be work involved at the start to 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 kind of get this get this up and running, get the development um, happening, and and allowing allowing yourself to be able to process these kind of messages. But the benefits far far sort of outweigh that in in, in the long run. Um, yeah, it's 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 definitely worth investing that time um, that you know might be challenges around mapping some of the ddex values to to some of the fields that you have in your local system and so on but but definitely it's it's well worth spending the time to do that um, because it's 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 definitely you you, you will get the benefits in, in the long run absolutely thank you mark do you have a last word or uh, you know, we value so much the DDX standards that, in fact, with record company uh, exchange of data, we don't accept any more other messages than DDX. With our sister MLCs, yes, we do accept other formats because most of many of them are not up to date on, on DDX uh, exchange, but uh, there will come a day. And we'll also say to them that we don't accept other things than DDX. Okay, thank you. Well, from a DDX perspective, that's all very good to hear. Um, thank you uh, very much to the panel, to, to Mark, Stuart, Rod, Luca and Rob and Mike. Um, I hope you found the discussion helpful in terms of uh, understanding some of the issues around the various uh, RDR standards. Um, if after leaving the um, webinar, a question occurs to you that you would like to get answered, please feel free to email to info at ddex.net and um, uh, the Secretariat will, will aim to answer your questions. Uh, and we hope, you know, what you've heard today will inspire you to think seriously about implementing one or more of the, of the DDEX standards. So thanks again to the panel. Thanks to my colleagues on the Secretariat. Um, and enjoy whatever is left of the rest of your day. So thanks very much indeed. Bye for now.